Hello and welcome back to Linear Algebra, the video series where we talk about vectors, matrices and related stuff. And indeed, in today's part 54, we will go deeper into the theory of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. We do this by discussing the so-called characteristic polynomial. However, before we start with the definition, I really want to thank all the nice people who support the channel steady on Patreon, here on YouTube or by other means. And please don't forget, as a supporter, you can download the PDF version and the quiz for this video. Okay, let's start this video by recalling that we define eigenvalues for square matrices. And in conclusion, this means that eigenvalues also make sense for linear maps from Rn to Rn again. Moreover, from the last video you might also remember that the defining equation was this eigenvalue equation given as Ax is equal to lambda times x. And then x is called an eigenvector of a if x is not equal to the zero vector. And now it turns out that knowing the eigenvectors of a matrix is very nice if you have to calculate with this matrix. In particular, in some sense these eigenvectors form an optimal coordinate system. This should not be a surprise because in the direction of the eigenvectors the matrix only scales the vector. In other words, the operation of the matrix is very simple in this eigenvector direction. And maybe let's visualize that for a 2 times 2 matrix. And let's assume that we know two eigenvectors x and y. Moreover, for the eigenvector x, let's say we have the eigenvalue 2. And for the other eigenvector, I want another eigenvalue, namely 1. Hence, with that, we already have two different directions in R2. And maybe let's say we find our vector x here and our vector y there. And of course, we already know they span our R2. In other words, we could also say they form a coordinate system in R2, which we could visualize with a grid. So we simply draw parallel lines for the vector x and parallel lines for the vector y. And what we get is this grid, which represents our optimal coordinate system. And we call it optimal because we already know what happens under the map Fa. Namely, the vector x is stretched by a factor 2 and the vector y is stretched by a factor 1. So in our image, this grid here now would look like this. It's simply stretched in both directions given by the eigenvectors, but in the one direction nothing happens. However, now this means that we can calculate the image of every vector, for example this one here. So let's call it u and then we see it's a linear combination of the vector x and y. So let's say we have a times x plus b times y. Of course, here in the picture we see for this example we have a and b equal to 2. Okay, and now this translates to the right hand side where we find the image of u. So for this example, here we have our vector a u. So simply speaking, because we know how the grid is transformed, we also know how each vector in it is transformed. However, obviously we can also calculate that. The only thing we need here is the linearity. This means we push the operation of a to x and to y independently. So we have lowercase a times ax plus b times ay. And there we already know what happens because x and y are eigenvectors by assumption. So we simply have the factor 2 and the factor 1 involved. So the result here is what we already knew. In the direction of x we have to scale by 2 and in the direction of y we have to scale by 1. So in other words, by knowing these two eigenvectors, the calculation with the matrix A gets very simple. And with that we immediately see the big advantage of eigenvectors. If we find enough eigenvectors, we can form such an optimal coordinate system. Therefore, the important question we have to answer in this video is how do we find enough eigenvectors? And indeed, we will see that the so-called characteristic polynomial is an important ingredient to answer this question. And in order to understand the definition, let's first recall what we know from the last video. 
we know that a non-vanishing vector x is an eigenvector associated to an eigenvalue lambda if and only if it lies in the kernel of A minus lambda identity matrix. In other words, we have an eigenvector for this eigenvalue lambda if and only if this kernel is non-trivial. However, this means that the matrix inside the kernel is a singular matrix. Hence, in the interesting case when we have eigenvectors, we have a non-invertible matrix here. And indeed, this is the key ingredient here because it means we can use the determinant to calculate eigenvalues. More precisely, we have a singular matrix if and only if this determinant is equal to zero. Therefore, this equivalence we can see here now connects the determinant with the existence of eigenvalues. Namely, the determinant being zero is now equivalent for lambda being an eigenvalue. Simply because if we know that the kernel is non-trivial, we have an eigenvector. And of course, for an eigenvector, we always have a corresponding eigenvalue. In other words, in order to find enough eigenvectors, the first step is to find all possible eigenvalues first. And now we can do that simply by calculating a determinant. And let's immediately demonstrate that with a 2 times 2 example. So let's take the matrix 3, 2, 1, 4. And now we have to change that matrix by subtracting lambda on the diagonal. Hence, we have 3 minus lambda and 4 minus lambda. And please note, outside of the diagonal, nothing changes. So please never forget, the identity matrix has only ones on the diagonal and otherwise zeros. Okay, and now this is the matrix where we want to calculate the determinant of. And in fact, for a 2 times 2 matrix, this is no problem at all for us. We simply multiply the diagonal minus multiplying the off diagonal. And we immediately see what comes out is a polynomial in lambda. And there you might already guess, this is exactly what we call the characteristic polynomial for the matrix A. And now finding eigenvalues just means finding the zeros of this characteristic polynomial. Hence, here we see it's just a quadratic equation in lambda. So you can just solve it in your favorite way. However, in this example, the solutions are very simple and we can immediately factorize it. This means, in this case here, we can immediately read the zeros. Namely, we have 5 and 2 as the zeros for this polynomial here. And now we know these two numbers correspond to eigenvalues of the matrix A. And in fact, this is our conclusion here. We write 2 and 5 are eigenvalues of A. And please don't forget, we know these are exactly all the eigenvalues of A. And now I would say, with this example in mind, we can go to the general case. So this means we want to know how the determinant looks in the n times n case. Therefore, let's calculate the determinant a minus lambda identity. And of course, this is now the n times n identity matrix. Therefore, this implies that we have to subtract lambda on the diagonal again. So in the first component, we have a11 minus lambda. So the whole diagonal looks like that, but we don't change the other entries. This is always important to remember, because in calculations, a lot of mistakes can happen. Okay, and now at this point, we can simply use the Leibniz formula to calculate this determinant. Of course, this does not give an explicit answer, but we immediately get an idea how this determinant looks like. Namely, we immediately recognize it's indeed a polynomial in lambda. In fact, one term in the Leibniz formula is the product of the diagonal. And we pick that here as the first term because it has the most lambdas in it. Indeed, multiplying that gives us minus lambda to the power n. And moreover, all other terms in the Leibniz formula have smaller exponents for lambda. Therefore, we can conclude that this here is a polynomial and the decree is n. In addition, we also know the leading coefficient. 
it's minus 1 to the power n for lambda to the power n. This is not hard to see because it immediately comes out of this multiplication here. However, the other coefficients might be harder to see, so we just call them c n minus 1, c n minus 2, and so on. Hence, the remaining constant in this polynomial we call c0. Okay, so there we have it. In general, this is the characteristic polynomial for a, and we know it's always of degree n, and it has the leading coefficient minus 1 to the power n. And then the only problem for the eigenvalues is that we have to find the zeros of this polynomial. However, before we do higher dimensional examples, we first should put this into a definition. So for a general square matrix A, the polynomial of degree n, given by the formula above, is called P with index A. And the definition says the variable lambda is sent to the determinant A minus lambda identity matrix. And in general, we call this map the characteristic polynomial of the square matrix A. So you should remember, this polynomial carries some information of the matrix A. Namely, it carries the information of the eigenvalues. So I would say, this is the takeaway message of this video. The zeros of the characteristic polynomial are exactly the eigenvalues of our matrix A. This means, now we have a method for finding all the eigenvalues of a given matrix A. Admittedly, it might not be easy, but we just have to find all the zeros of the characteristic polynomial. And indeed, for lower dimensional examples, this should not be a problem for us. However, I would say we discuss more details in the next videos. So I really hope that I see you there, and have a nice day. Bye bye.